Welcome everybody to our webinar and I just want to introduce us. My name is Elisa Bronfman. I'm a psychologist and I've been at Boston Children's Hospital for 23 years working with kids with medical illness and I want to introduce my colleagues, Annie Banks. She's a social worker in the Center for Families and she has been a social worker for 30 years and also my colleague Gail is a child life specialist, Gail Winmuller, and she's been a child life specialist for 11 years. We're going to talk to you today about the concept of um, how to help your kids get through vaccinations, blood draws, pokes of all kinds. We have a PowerPoint we're going to share with you uh, starting now. And I want to tell you that we have a set PowerPoint and um, we have things we want to present. So we're going to hold questions till the end. But at the end, if you put your questions in the Q&A section, we will be very happy to um, answer them at the end if we haven't answered them during the presentation. So thank you all for coming to our webinar. One other uh, business note to tell you is that we're planning on doing um, a series of seminars, preferably um, monthly, but we might not have one in February. We might start more monthly in March on a topics related to helping kids deal with medical illness in our hospital. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. So our next slide. So this is what we're going to discuss today. I'm not going to discuss any of these topics in detail, but I'm going to tell you what we're going to get to today so you can have an idea about what our presentation will be. Um, we're going to talk about how parents and caregivers can help reduce child anxiety. We're going to talk about giving honest explanations and communications to children, uh, the importance of pre preparation for medical care. We're going to give you some specific strategies to use in preparation to improve child coping and hopefully your own too. We're going to talk about when is scared of needles actually considered needle phobia and when you might need additional mental health support. We have a plan also to share these slides with you because we think the slides are valuable. We're going to share them with you maybe several days after the seminar, but this is going to be recorded and we're going to have a link to it or we're going to find a way for people to rewatch if they were interested. And we're also going to try to get anybody who attended today the PowerPoint from this presentation. So we have a video from Montreal Children's Hospital that's just a short clip of highlighting some of the strategies and some of the problems that happen. Hi, how is everyone today? You're going to get some needles today, young lady. Yeah, we are. You know, Mom, it doesn't really have to be this way. I know I have meals, but I don't have to be. You can just ask me with some fun games and get me to take a few new questions like mine that You can even put a special cream on there so the needle won't hurt you. This can all be a lot easier. Still, you just have the whole headache to help. Do the plug me skin or the thing of song. Do the, the cord me to take some deep breaths and play with the wings of that bug. Don't tell me it's going to be okay. Don't tell me it'll be all of it. That can make me feel okay. It's better to fix my mind up. Come on, they don't tell me. Come here, Bubba. It's been really helpful for me. Please share this with your friends. <laughs> Remember, distract. Take deep breaths. Use topical anesthetics. And don't say, it'll be okay, or it'll be over soon. To learn more, visit our website. Uh -oh. Sorry. <laughs> so 
our goals for getting kids needles, immunizations, blood draws, the point is to get medicine to children or information from a blood draw, but it's also really important to us that the child feels safe, secure, willing to return, and that they associate Children's Hospital with a positive place to be, somewhere they had a good experience, somewhere that helped them. Medical fears are very common in children. Uh, in addition to fear of needles and blood draws, kids are afraid about being examined, swabbed, taking off their clothes, blood pressure cuffs, thermometers. Many parts of the hospital and hospital procedures are scary to children. So it's, not, it's very normal. And it's estimated that 25% of adults fear needles. Even more kids, of course, fear shots and blood draws. So that's what we're hoping to help you with today. So um, parents and caregivers, we can all help reduce kids' anxiety. And lots of studies have found that parental behavior is really one of the main predictors of how a child is going to respond in a medical setting. If you seem relaxed, your child will be more relaxed too. Um, so how do we get you more relaxed? Well, consider ways to manage your own anxiety about um, the upcoming poke for your child, such as breathing, making sure you're grounded, which means you can, you know, making sure that your feet are firmly planted on the floor if you're sitting or standing, um, visualizing a positive experience for you and your child, and take note of pleasant sounds or smells or sights in your surroundings or whatever you do to relax. Calm is absolutely catching. And um, our kids are looking to us as models. So as I was saying, you can model calm, positive coping. First, you have to get relaxed yourself. Um, and when we're anxious, it can really make kids scared too. Um, so things that you can do to model calm, positive coping um, with your child, smiling, talking about neutral topics that have nothing to do with the poke or the doctor, um, noticing things in the environment, and also assuring your child that you will not leave them, that you will be there with them and they won't be alone. Um, ironically, being empathic toward distress um, like saying, oh, that must really hurt, that must be very awful, um, actually can really enhance distress. And that's kind of counterintuitive, but the, the best thing to do is show confidence in your child, you know, make statements like, you can do this, you did it, um, that will improve outcomes and feelings. And so you can be positive without ignoring your child's fears. Um, and really, you just need to have faith in their resilience for getting through this challenging situation and other challenging situations. So one of the best ways to do this is, you know, have honest communication and explanations. Um, I think we often think that if we, we just kind of don't tell them what's going to happen, it won't be as scary. But in fact, um, being really honest and clear at their level um, helps them feel much more in control. So children need accurate, non-threatening, very simple descriptions of what they'll experience to promote positive relationships with their providers going forward and to be able to trust you to know that you'll be honest in this situation and other situations. Um, talk with them about what the space is going to look like if you know. Um, you can get in touch with the hospital and um, or where you're going and get a plan of what the space is going to look like and what they're going to confront. Also, explaining to a child why they need a poke um, can really be helpful so that they have some understanding. Um, so like the doctors need to look at your blood and make sure that it's healthy or vaccination will keep you from getting very sick. That helps them get through. Here's some other statements that might be helpful when you think about honest communication with children. Um, be honest that the poke is hard. So um, you don't have to make a big deal about it, but it is difficult. 
So you could just say getting a poke is not your favorite thing. I know that. Um, remind the child of past successes. You did it before, you can do it again. And again, I'd say past successes in this kind of situation and in other situations. Um, you know, you've done hard things before, you can do this again. You can help your child script their own positive response. So talk with your child um, and come up with words from them that they make for themselves. For example, you know, I don't like it, but then I'll have less of a chance of getting the flu or COVID. Or I know it's uncomfortable, but then it's done and I get a prize. Or simply, you know, I can do it. I believe that I can do it. Um, these are scripts that really help kids feel like they're in control. So you can tell preparation is very important. Um, it is essential for kids and for parents. We all do better in these kinds of situations when we know what to expect and there are no surprises. Because when there's the shock of an unpleasant surprise, it can make future situations scarier. So preparation also includes preparing how to cope and having a plan for dealing with the visit and the poke. Again, this is about helping your child feel empowered and in control and helping you feel more empowered and in control. So we're gonna review some specific strategies to use in preparation to improve coping. We'll be talking about the following strategies, medical play, use of choices during procedures, relaxation techniques to practice with your child, distraction, pairing and reinforcement, comfort positions. We'll show you some hold. Um, coping script and my hospital story, we'll describe what that is and advocating for pain control by calling ahead of the visit. So now I'm gonna pass this on to my colleague, Gail. Hi, so I'm gonna be first talking about, the, I'll be talking about all the different strategies that we can use. Um, one of the best ways to prepare a child for any kind of hospital visit or medical um, visit is to allow them to play with medical-like materials. Um, Mr. Rogers always said that, you know, people think of play as a break from their work, but, but in reality, for a child, play is their work. That's how they're doing their serious learning. So um, it also allows the children to express their feelings and gives them a sense of control over the situation. So what, what we do with medical play is we'll give a we'll let children play with their dolls or a stuffed animal and use either um, a play medical kit or just some real band-aids and Q-tips and cotton balls. Um, you can get an oral syringe at the pharmacy, one that kids usually take medicine with, but it's just like a regular syringe, except there's no needle. Um, and you can also ask your provider for some supplies. A lot of times they'll provide it for you to you explain that you want your child to practice and play, do medical play and pretend they're the doctor. Um, and the other thing that can happen is when you're playing with them, you can find out that they have some misconceptions or misunderstandings about what's gonna happen. And this is an opportunity for you to clarify what actually is gonna happen. Kids have a great imagination and sometimes they think something is gonna happen that isn't gonna happen or they've misunderstood it because they hear things concretely rather than what we mean. Like a blood draw is not coloring with crayons, um, it's a blood draw <laughs> instead of drawing, you know, with crayons. Um, next, we're going to talk about um, another kind of medical play, which is using the metal equipment, the medical equipment, but in a fun way. Um, for example, these two pictures show one boy using a syringe for painting and another one using it with water and even in a bathtub using a syringe can be a lot of fun. And it changes the way um, children perceive what a, like what a syringe is. It becomes less negative for them. And they learn best by using them and, do, use, and doing things with their equipment, with the equipment. Um, another important thing for children when they're coming into an, a doctor's appointment or coming in for procedure is to have opportunities for choice. Most kids walk into a doctor's office and feel like 
everything's going to happen to them and no one's going to give them any choices or ask them questions. It's all going to be, you know, sit on the table, do this, do that. I'm going to listen to your heart. But if we can incorporate um, questions that are realistic, choices that are realistic choices, that can help them feel in control. So for example, if you ask your child, do you want to sit on the chair or do you want to sit on my lap? That's a realistic choice that we can live with the answer because whichever they choose is going to be okay. Now, if we ask them a question like, uh, would you like to sit on the chair? Is that okay? They can say no. And then what are you going to do then? It sort of leaves it open ended. So you want to make sure that the choices are very clearly defined and that they can choose one or the other and that you and the um, professionals, the doctors and nurses will also be comfortable with the answer they give, that the child gives. Um, the other thing about choices is a lot of children try to procrastinate things happening. And so they'll drag out their decision making about their choice. And it's very important to make it clear that they have, to, these are your choices and we need an answer. Because the more time that passes by, the more anxious the child becomes. So reducing the waiting um, along with the quick intervention is usually the most helpful way to go. Um, another choice that is also very important to offer is, do you want to watch your shot or your blood draw or do you want to look away or do you want me to help you look away? Um, that gives children control, but a lot of times, believe it or not, they change their mind. So it's okay to let them change their mind. If, they, if you have a book blocking their view from an IV or a shot and they push the book away, let them push it away. It means they've decided they want to see what's going on. Now, some strategies for relaxing, there's different types of breathing techniques that you can use. Um, and this, the first one is something that I use and my children use on a regular basis when we get stressed. So it's a it's not just related to medical situations. It's anytime you're stressed. Um, if you if you breathe slowly in through your nose and then out through your mouth and just do that over and over again, your whole body relaxes and it's much easier to get through anything that's causing you stress. And in addition to that, another kind of breathing is related to when a child's getting a blood draw or a, a vaccination. If you ask the nurse to count to three and while the nurse is counting to three, you breathe in, big breath. And then when she gets to three and does the poke, you give a big breath out. That makes your body relax and it makes the IV easier to access and it makes the discomfort of a vaccine a lot less. There's some other types of breathing practice that kids can do at home that can be really fun. Um, one is to pretend you have a birthday cake. Um, there's also a birthday cake app that if you blow on your phone, the candle goes out. So that's kind of fun. Um, I think it's just called birthday candles. Um, bubbles are great to use, but currently, Boston Children's Hospital doesn't allow bubbles because of COVID and blowing isn't, isn't highly recommended with COVID. Um, but to pretend there's a big bubble is a great way to, to go. And the other fun thing to do with kids is giving them a ping pong ball and a straw and they, have to, they push the um, ping pong ball by blowing through the straw and the, it'll make the ping pong ball roll across the table or through a maze or across the floor. And it's a great way to practice breathing. There are lots of other resources for relaxation for those of you that want to practice at home and learn more about relaxation. There are many great apps, Headspace, Calm, 10% Happier. I recommend if you're going to allow your child to use these that you demo them yourself and pick one that you think your child will like. There's also Yoga Kids has some relaxation um, programs, like Indigo Dreams, um, Ocean Dreams. You can buy those on iTunes. Their stories, affirmations, some body scans for relaxation as well. I like them. A lot of kids, several kids who had trouble sleeping and listened to those Indigo Dreams are suddenly sleeping, which is another side effect you might like at some point. 
Um, there's also, if you want your kids moving more at home to get relaxed and to when they're really feeling overly active, Go Noodle is another good example for younger kids. And also for older teens, self-help books can be helpful in learning relaxation strategies, including breathing and other strategies for learning to relax. Don't, um, what to Do When You Worry Too Much is probably the most popular book by Don Hubner, who has a whole series of books on managing different feelings for, I would say, the 10 to 15, 16 year old kids. So we're also talking a lot about using distraction. So by distraction, we mean, we, we mean getting the kids' minds somewhere else. And it's important to think about this both before, during, and after the poke or whatever procedure you're coming to. So to come in, come in with a coping plan, a toolbox of things you've thought of that will distract your child. So I think you can think, okay, should I bring a toy they haven't seen that's novel? Should I um, have a new, a new something to watch on a phone or an iPad? I think about it well before the procedure so you're not searching or looking for something right while you're there. Think about the time period of something like an immunization or a blood draw as not just the time and when you're getting it, but the time going to the hospital to get it and the car ride. They, your child could already be getting anxious, anxious in the waiting room, also um, in, in the procedure room, as well as after the fact as well. So we want to think about um, distraction as the purposeful refocusing of your child's attention away from the poke. And choosing the distraction should be part of your preparation plan as we're talking about thinking about it in advance. And you have to think about it developmentally for where your child's at. Um, we're sort of thinking about, somebody had asked about newborns and definitely you wanna think about it for your newborn too. They may not know what's gonna come, but thinking about being calm yourself and relaxed for them is a helpful thing to do. So they'll still see how you're feeling. So doing things to relax yourself is going to be very important. And then thinking about what do they like, rocking, singing, eye contact, sucking a pacifier, nursing, toys with lights and sounds, things that attract their attention are important to think about for the very young babies. For younger kids or developmentally young kids, you wanna think about how to keep them occupied. The idea is to involve them in something. Something that involves their active participation is more distracting than, for example, just listening to a story. It's more distracting to have to pick up the pieces of a pop-up the book or a lift the flap book or to touch something on a phone or a device or an iPad so, or to even look in a Where's Waldo book is more active than just hearing a story. So something that's active and also something that can be done with just one hand. Because remember, while they're actually getting their poke, they're going to need to have one arm that's not involved in whatever distraction activity that you're picking, at least for that part of your plan. For, um, for those younger kids, there's a great app that was introduced to Annie and myself by Gail called Duck Duck Moose that has songs on it that kids can be engaged with, videos on your phone, such as puppy videos or anything your child likes, thinking about something they like, and potentially something that they don't get to do all the time, something novel and exciting. Puppets, and again, these interactive books, things that you can touch or be involved with. And then for our older kids, uh, maybe work with them. If they're teenagers, they can work on developing their own playlist thinking about riddles or Mad Libs, uh, movies or television shows that you can watch together, thinking about fun conversational topics to think about, preferably not things that are stressful. Uh, I spy game in the room is always fun. And there are apps on your phone or their phone that you can get them a new app that makes it especially exciting. Although sometimes that can be frustrating. So I wanna give them a little lead time, but bin art, cut the rope, where's my water? These are good ones that you can try. Uh, what I'd say is, though, make sure these things fit with your family values, and it's absolutely fine if it's not a device, if it's something else, but if it's a book, have it be something that they can be involved with. Pairing. So pairing is when you pair something positive with a medical procedure and the child develops a positive association. So it's different than a reward because it's not earned. The example would be you're playing pleasant music while the procedure is, is happening, while you're getting a shot. That procedure feels just a little bit different because that's music you really enjoy. Um, 
it, it, it happens just after the event or while the event is going on. It could be also watching a favorite video, going to the park. Sometimes people, we want people to pair the hospital with fun things such as, you know, the, the I forget what it's called, the thing that makes the bing bang that the ball rolls around. I remember the first time we bought one of those at the hospital, the first time we had one, and the chief of psychology said to me, do you know how much that cost? And then he told me, I guess I shouldn't share, but it cost a lot of money. I said, wow, that's a lot of money. And he said, it's worth every penny for kids to come into our hospital and enjoy seeing something or have something that really involves them that they like, that they look forward to seeing that's fun and not a procedure at our hospital. So I think developing those things, or you go, maybe you go look at the fish in the aquarium, or you go um, look at one of those bouncy balls things, looking at things on the walls in our hospital. Part of the reason they're there is we're trying to pair our hospital with things that are fun to look at and fun to do other than coming in for help and procedures that are not what kids maybe look forward to or understand. So different than pairing, but in the same family of interventions is reinforcement. And that's where children earn a prize for doing, for, sometimes it can simply be for enduring the procedure. It doesn't have to be good behavior in the procedure. You can say, well, you're gonna get this shot and afterwards you're gonna earn something. Or it can just be that you say, if you prefer pairing, you can say afterwards we're going to get blah, 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 or go somewhere, whatever it is that you're going to do, make as your plan. The key here is that we want you doing a little preparation with your kids. And in addition to creating a coping toolbox yourself to bring, it doesn't have to be a literal toolbox. It could just be a couple of things on your phone or toys that you've put in your pocket, a plan about how to distract your child, thinking about all the steps that they're going to go through in whatever procedure they're coming for. So let's say that it was a shot. And you should do this whether you're doing pairing or you're doing reinforcement, whichever of those you choose to do. Think about the steps they're going to go through in coming for a shot. So you could say, we're gonna go in a car, we're gonna get to the children's hospital garage, we're gonna go to the fifth floor of the Fagan building, for example. Then you can also Im embed your coping strategies there. You can say, and then we'll play or we'll read your special Where's Waldo book. And then we'll be in the waiting room. If you want to, you can have a snack. You can put those things in your plan too. Just you have to make sure to follow through. And sometimes people really do it as a checklist. Uh, we're gonna go in with the doctor or the nurse. You'll pull your sleeve up. Then you'll get, your arm will be cleaned with a, a wet wipe or a wet cloth, whatever, however you want to describe that. Then your arm will have a little squeeze or gentle squeeze. And then you'll get the poke and then either we'll go have this prize if there's going to be a small prize or uh, likewise we'll we'll go pick something out or we'll, whatever it is afterwards it doesn't have to be a specific thing the thing is it has to be potentially something meaningful for your child if you if you tell me i'm earning a prize of baseball cards for me that's not a positive prize but as i've learned earlier that would be a prize for gail's son so you have to pick a prize that that person would like and you don't want to give them a huge prize, which I know is also counterintuitive. Let's say I told any of us we were going to get a million dollars to get a shot. That tells you that that shot is very dangerous. So you want it to be small, something that says this actually isn't that big a deal. It's something that we do. We think it might be hard for you, a little hard for you, so you get a little prize. And actually, with the baseball cards, what I... What I would do, my son had several appointments that he had to go to um, where he had to get an IV placed. And we would open the cards as he performed each step of the process. So, um, you know, they would have to pull up his sleeve. So we'd start opening up the pack and then he'd get a band on his arm. We'd take out the first card and look at it. And we'd talk about the card and he would tell me, he knew a lot about baseball and would share about the player and if they're good players or he knows them and it became part of the process of getting um the iv and it, it really helped him um the other thing actually i've done i did with one of my daughters was i had a bunch of little small prizes that i knew she would like and wrap them and then she would unwrap them she get to pick one to unwrap each step of the way so that's another way of giving reinforcement and also pairing positive things with the visit. 
sort of does both. Um, and then I'm gonna to continue to talk about other things we can do to help children um, when they're having their pokes. Um, these are five different comfort positions. Um, and you can, um, one important thing is that you talk to the nurse because sometimes a um, you might prefer a position that the nurse has a harder time doing the vaccination of the blood draw, but it's something to talk about. How can you hold your child in a way that will benefit them by feeling secure and snuggled and hugged and that the nurse can also do what she needs to do? So um, the chest to chest is sort of giving your child a big hug with their legs around them. Um, side sitting is the same thing, but the arm is, you know, sitting the child's back to your front, but the arm is much better exposed. Um, with a baby swaddling them up like you would after a diaper change, it's the same thing, but it gives them that sense of security. Um, a side hug is for a child who's like sitting in bed and um, can't really get up and you can't hold them. And back to chest, I don't, if you look carefully, this mother has her legs wrapped around the child's legs. And that gives a little more security for um, both the child and for who's ever doing the blood draw, that if your child is anxious and might kick, um, this stops them from doing that, but it's a, a secure hug. It's um, most kids I've seen have that happen really in, don't mind at all that their parents are totally snuggling them. So these are suggestions for ways of sitting. Um, and lying down, as it turns out, is actually uh, not a great approach because kids feel much more vulnerable um, if they're in a lying down position and they feel less control. So if you can figure out a way to have them in a sitting position, one of these or some variation of this, it can be very helpful. Um, next, actually, um, Elisa talked a little bit about this. Um, doing a preparation story or a coping script. Um, after you've talked about with your child all different plans, like maybe they've picked out a video they're gonna watch or um, a prize they want, if they wanna do basketball cards or baseball cards, whatever, is to make a list of the steps that they're going to take from the time you arrive at the hospital until you are leaving. Um, and you can even have them illustrated if you'd like, if the, your kid is into drawing, you know, you can make a book about what's going to happen and they can draw pictures of what's going to happen. Um, but it's nice for them to have this special plan of what's going to go on during their, um, their hour or however long they're going to be at the hospital, whatever they're, they're getting. And this can be generalized to procedures, not just for um, IVs and blood draws and, and other pokes. Um, and again, you know, including if you're gonna do a special prize, if a treat at the end, or if you're gonna do an activity after that makes the day special, like go to the park or something, that could be in this as well. The hospital offers stories that are already made. Um, they're written it from the child's perspective. They're called My Hospital Stories. And they're available if you go to the Boston Children's Hospital website and search My Hospital Stories, there's a list of stories that comes up for the Boston um, building as well as Waltham and all the other satellite locations. It has photographs of, bo there's boy stories and girl stories of them coming in for various procedures. Um, the one that's close is appropriate for this talk is the one that is called phlebotomy or blood draws. Um, and it, when it's in the perspective of the child, the story will say something like, I'm going to the doctor today. We are going to go up the elevator. We're going to go into the waiting room. I'm going to stand quietly while my mother checks us into the waiting room, et cetera, et cetera. So it was all first person. And there's actual photographs from Boston Children's Hospital of the children you know, of a girl or a boy going into each step of whatever, wherever they're going in the hospital. It's not in every department, but there are a lot of it, a lot of the stories and it's a growing library. So it's worth checking back because 
we're constantly adding stories to this. Um, the other thing that parents, most parents aren't aware of is that they have the ability to advocate for their child for pain medicine. Um, we suggest that if you're going to do this, that you call ahead of time because not all areas of the hospital have the different kinds of pain um, reduction techniques in their area and you can call and ask. Also sometimes um, because of allergies or because of um, you know, illnesses that your child has had in the past or ha currently has, some of these may not be ex okay medically for your child. But most of the time, something will work for your child that can help. So for example, Sweeties, it's called, is a sugar, like a sugar water. It's 24% sugar and the rest is water. It's for children that are newborns to six months old. And some articles actually say they're, it's good until they're 12 months. There's sort of a, a mix. I've been reading some articles about it. And some of them do say that up to 12 months babies can um, benefit from this. It's a mild um, analgesic, which is a pain reliever. Um, and what happens is you two minutes before they're going to get their poke, um, you would give them either you dip your pacifier in the liquid and then give it to the baby, or another type is this little tube that um, you can drip into the baby's mouth just on the tip of their tongue. Um, and then as the, when the procedure begins, you give them another um, like pacifier with the sugar water and the analgesic effect usually lasts about five to eight minutes. And you can sort of judge if your child's getting a little fussy and it's taking longer than expected to do, say a blood draw, you can continue to dip your the pacifier in and give it to your baby. Um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is Elamax or Emla. This is a cream that comes in a tube. This you can ask your doctor for, they can actually um, give you a prescription for this. Um, and you, what you do is if, they're, if the child's getting a shot, you put the cream on their arm, you cover it with a band-aid, a bandage, a large bandage, um, and it has to be 30 to 60 minutes before they're gonna have the blood draw for the IV um, because it takes that long for the skin to numb. But many children don't feel it at all. Some fe kids feel a little pinch anyway, but it's very effective. Um, Sonera patch is another type of um, lidocaine, similar to the Elamax, but it's a patch that you put on the arm. There's no cream involved. Um, Buzzy is a little, um, a little thing that vibrates. Um, it can be in the shape of a bee like this one, or it can be a ladybug. And it vibrates, and it also has the wings of the, um, the bee or the uh, ladybug are frozen. Um, little ice packs. So it freezes the skin and it jiggles the skin. And for some reason, when you jiggle a kid's skin um, and do the vaccination at the same time, they feel it much less. I don't really understand why, but it works. And I've gate seen it work. Gate control of gate control, <clears throat> they say. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Um, and the last thing is a, a lot of the areas have freezing spray. They can just spray fro freezing stuff on their arm. Um, or you could even bring an ice pack with you if they're getting a vaccine and put the ice pack on their arm and numb their arm that way, which is very simple. Um, ice is, and freezing spray is not good for IVs because it will constrict the veins and make it more difficult. So um, the, the freezing and the ice is not best for vaccinations, not for blood draws. So okay. when is, thank you, Kale, that was great. So when, when is scared of needles actually needle phobia? So because so many kids are scared of needles, it's almost strange when children aren't scared of needles. You know, and they, 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 most kids are a little afraid of something that's going to pinch or hurt or they think will pinch or hurt. So um, how do you know when it's gone to the point of needle phobia that you might want to get professional help for your child? So here's some questions you can ask yourself. It's on the next two slides that you can look this over. But the first one is if the child has repeated problems with medical care, maybe more than other children that you know, or the fear is out of proportion to the situation. So 
um, that might be, um, we go back one more just so I I'm sorry. cover all of them. No, it's okay. Um, fear is out of proportion, meaning that they, uh, they might say, I wonder if I'll die. Will the shot kill me? If the, will, the, will all my blood come out if I'm getting a blood draw? These, these are out of proportion, distorted kinds of ways to think that you obviously want to correct and talk to them honestly about, but show that they're having more anxiety than you would expect. When they avoid getting medical care, when they hide in your home, when you tell them you're taking them for an appointment, when they seem extremely terrified, more distressed than you would expect, screaming and crying, you can tell on their face that they're just beyond, beyond uh, terrified. When they think about the procedure outside of the situation more than you would expect. Now you'd probably tell them we're gonna go get your vaccination tomorrow. You might tell them that the day before, depending on the age more or less time on that but you wouldn't expect them two weeks ahead or a month ahead to be asking am i going to the doctor am i getting a shot or to continue talking about it weeks after a vaccination or a blood draw occurred that would be um, more anxiety than we would hope for them to experience it's also really important to think about getting extra help when you can't get your child needed treatment uh, for example i know someone who needs a particular uh, procedure that requires blood draws, but they're too afraid of the blood draws to get it, so it's hard for them to follow through on a needed intervention for their health. That obviously makes it a more urgent issue to get care if you're afraid of needles. Um, if with the suggestions we've given that you've tried some of them and they don't seem to be working for you, and the child continues to show distress before, during, and after the procedure, and obviously it's probably normative it is normative for kids to cry a little when they're getting a shot some don't some do but it's still normative but if you see these these kinds of things then you might want to seek additional help so if the, if, the, if thinking about shots blood draws or medical procedures is affecting your child's functioning outside of a clinic visit then think about added um, actually getting that mental health care. Those things are like not sleeping well, not eating well, a loss of energy, a developmental regression, which just means doing things that are for younger than their age or having more separation anxiety or any dramatic change in behavior. And by the way, I'm going to tell you that if any of these things happen at any time, you want to talk to your pediatrician and sort of think if mental health care is, is um, in order just because these are signs that your child isn't functioning well. Well, I want to say one more thing before we go to our thank you, which is all of these strategies, these are a lot of strategies. You've all been very, uh, what a great audience. So thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. But what I would say to you is that um, individualize what we've said for you and your family based on your values, your child's likes, your child's needs, what you know your child best and what they uh, what they would benefit from and who they are, which strategies will work best for them. So Gail knew her son would like those baseball cards. With my daughter, I didn't actually um, give her any prizes, but she really liked to rehearse for herself the cognitive strategy. She would say, I'm getting this so I won't get the flu. I'm getting this and I'll never get the flu so badly as other kids if I get this shot. And hopefully everybody gets a flu shot. I tried to get her on board about those kinds of missions early on. So just even thinking about individualize this for your family. And then to our last thank you slide. I can say, I have to say for my family, um, my kids didn't have fast food except on special days. And um, when Burger King was where we went after, um, after any kind of difficult poke, um, because that was a very special thing in their, in their world, in our world. So. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And um, anybody who has a question, please put it in the Q&A. We have a couple of questions there right now. Um, and I'm going to go with the second question first, which is, would you recommend to have shots at the start or end of an annual checkup, um, given that she knows, the child knows it's coming? Um, do, Elise and Gail, do you have any thoughts about that? I definitely I think part of it depends on how old the child is. And um, I want to say part of it is knowing your child and what they would benefit from. Anticipatory anxiety can make things harder. So I, I think I might talk with your child about when it might be best 
for for them to get that shot and very often if they're considering and thinking about getting a shot the entire appointment then they're not able to participate in answering or, or I don't want to say enjoying the rest of a medical appointment but feeling okay for the rest of the appointment if they know that's coming so I think having control is a big part of it is something that I would say and um, talking to your doctor ahead because sometimes they have their rigid ways of doing things as well because you know my doctor told me to lie to my child <laughs> not lie she said don't tell her what are you telling I said it's time for your shot now during the because they were trying to sneak it so she didn't see it and I I didn't I said hey you're gonna get your shot now and they were angry with me and she didn't I, but she did better she was gonna do better with knowing and I had already been working at children's for a number of years at that point so I didn't really want to do it that way but I think know your child I think very often if you can say to your pediatrician you know I think she'd like to get the shot done first that's very empowering and um and gives a, a lot of control for a child to do it that way but Gail what do you think yeah I agree I think ask a a child who's old enough um, to know way in advance or to know beforehand is also old enough to say, you know, what's going to be easier for you? Is it going to be easier to just get it done and then we can do the regu our regular checkup? Or is it going to be easier for you to put it off as long as you can? So, and that does, again, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's an acceptable kind of question to ask where the answer is not a no, but it's yes before or yes after. It's um, a controlled choice, as you said, Gail. And exactly. I also want to say, you always, Gail told you this, but I'm going to say it again. It's just like, you don't want things that are simply delay tactics. Because when kids say, can I get it in five minutes? They mean, I hope five minutes will, can, there'll be a series of five minutes, which mean never. So right. you, you, so I know Gail already <laughs> told you that, but in this case, I think, I think that was a great question because it's also knowing that you know your child better than other people do to know what's best for him or her. Right. And, and we that's have a one, few more. Oh, go ahead, Gail. No, and I, it's very important to recognize that you're the parents and you do know your child the best and, you know, recommendations are recommendations, but they're not necessarily right for your child. And so you work with your child, you work within what, um, you know, works for you and your child and, and trust yourself. Um, and we have a before few more great. Can I just <laughs> make one more point before I forget? I'm sorry, and I wanna hear the question. Sorry, Annie. So okay. uh, we just wanna let you guys know that we are going to, the Family Medical Coping Initiative is going to do a series of talks, if I didn't tell you that. I, our next one is gonna be, staring questions and teasing about a medical condition which probably be applicable for parents who want to figure out how to respond to those things as well as for um, how to help your child respond to those things but anyway i'm sorry about that annie what's our next question no no that's that's okay we have several great questions and about 10 minutes so i think we can cover this um please send in more questions if you like so um, here's a question. Is, is there a preference between using actual medical equipment during play versus toy medical equipment, such as, you know, real blood pressure cuff, syringes, mm. et cetera? And I'm going to toss that to you, Gail. I have ideas um, too. Oh, yeah, and Elisa well, too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think it depends um, a lot on your, your child, again, on your child, their age, their development. Um, you know, very young kids that are like, toddlers and um, I think the play medical kits are good, but a child who's had a lot of experience in the hospital, um, I've worked with children who have been oncology patients and they know all the equipment. They really, like a two and a half year old might really enjoy and understand and appreciate using the real equipment. Whereas the average child who hasn't had that kind of exposure um, does better probably with the pretend kit. And then as they get older and they understand more about um, medical procedures, I would then go to the real equipment. But Band-Aids, things that they see all the time is great to incorporate into their medical, their, plas their pretend medical kits. The piece I wanted to add though is depends on how serious their, their fear of the objects are. So if kids are very afraid, of, I, I agree with Gail and everything Gail said, and the, the real kids enjoy being in the cat control power position with a, a monkey that you can buy with long arms or a doll and being the doctor or nurse or technician themselves, they really enjoy that. 
but many kids are too afraid to use the actual medical equipment, even touching it, or kids who've had a lot of procedures are sometimes very phobic of those actual things. So sometimes you have to start with things that are less scary and a plastic, very fake uh, tool might be where you need to start with a child who has more fear and then work your way up. And in in we're sort of thinking of beating anxiety, you have to do it by starting at an easier point and fake equipment is an easier point than realistic equipment. So working your way up from something that's not real, real really realistic, so it feels less threatening to something that's more realistic might be necessary for someone who has a greater fear level. Okay, next question. Um, a great question. Can you send this talk to us? Um, somebody wants to share it with others. Absolutely. Uh, we will send you the PowerPoint slides and um, the recording of this will be available um, on our website. And maybe YouTube we're talking about. And maybe you and right and maybe YouTube. Um, we'll keep you informed. Um, this is my child is three and a half and she has big hospital visit coming up. How do how soon do I tell her? Um, and I love the holding ideas. We use them and practice at home. So it's not only a doctor's thing. Um, so right. So um, a three and a half year old child, how soon do you tell them? Well, it depends on the kid too. Yeah. We have we have a kind of a rule of thumb that we go by, but I I don't completely go along with it. The rule of thumb is one day per year of age, but telling a two-year-old two days in advance is too much, is too soon. So I would think, and even for a five-year-old, five days. So I would tweak those numbers um, and do less than their age, but it also depends on the personality of your child and how anxious they get. And you don't want them losing sleep for three or four days. Um, some ch children do well knowing the day before, some of them better in you know, a few hours before, but you always wanna have time to prepare and talk about it so that it's not just a shock. So it also depends on what your schedule looks like. I would um, also say this, two, two other things to add in. Um, tell your child when they're gonna hear from other people or when, like if they're gonna go to appointment and hear about their procedure coming up, you have to tell them if they're gonna hear and know. So, you know, I, 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 that's one thing. So like you have to tell the information when a child's gonna, gonna find out another way that things are always better coming from parents every time. Uh, I had a slightly different formula in my own head about timing, which was um, the day before for preschoolers, a day or two for elementary, and then um, for a, a child, who's a little older but maybe not like sort of like that tweener like maybe a week before three to four days to a week and then for teenagers at the same time that you would find out but that's with the caveat depending on your child if they're a very anxious child you're going to adapt just as gail said the thing that we're trying to avoid many times people would tell their children about a procedure as they're driving them would tell them we're going to mcdonald's and then instead swerve into the hospital like wait this isn't mcdonald's we, that actually creates problems. Uh, I've had kids who've developed fear of cars, refusal to go places because they think they're afraid that they're just gonna be put in a car and taken somewhere. So you do wanna tell them, but not right at nighttime also when they're gonna go to sleep be, before bedtime. And um, again, using those um, timelines Gail and I were talking about. Um, here's a question. How does a newborn have a blood draw? And I'm wondering how to sue them. Where will the draw be and how can we keep him still for long enough? I know you talked a little bit about ways to hold Gail, comfort holds, but um, any any other thoughts about this, about where a blood draw might take place for a newborn? It, it depends on the, um, the amount of blood that they need. A lot of time it's a heel stick. Um, and if they just need a, like a drop of blood, that's a typical newborn. Um, but if they need to put in IV, it'll be um, usually, I think, in their arm. Um, and again, you know, nursing a baby is a wonderful way. I know it, some people feel like that's may be a negative association, but it's found to be a very positive thing for newborns to be nursing while they get their um, pokes of any kind. Um, and again, the sweeties is a great way to help reduce the pain um, and discomfort. Um, but it depends on the amount of blood they need and the nurse and your child, because if they're like have chunky little arms, it might be more difficult to get an IV there. So, um, but generally speaking, I think most newborns get 
heal sticks is how they get their blood. Okay, next question. Thank you, Gail. Mm -hmm. Can parents get the pain relief patch days ahead of a shot or blood draw, or is it something we have to wait upon arrival to the appointment? So um, the I'm not sure if you can get a prescription for a Sonera patch, but you can definitely get a prescription for the Emla cream or Ella Max. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure if they're still doing this, but um, Boston Children's Hospital a few years ago was were giving out free Emla and Tegaderm, which is the type of bandage that's best um, from the pharmacy. So if you're at an appointment and the doctor says, oh, you're gonna need a blood draw today, you could go to the pharmacy, pick up your free Emla and Tegaderm, and then put it on before you head down to phlebotomy. I don't know if they're still um, doing that. And I don't know if things have changed because of COVID. A lot of things have changed because of COVID, um, but you can definitely ask your doctor for a prescription and you can also purchase the Tegaderm bandages, which are a clear bandage that they, you put on top. So you can see the cream through it and it just should be like a bubble of cream on their arm um, or, you can, if it's a blood draw, you can also ask, um, if you have time to wait, you can go down to phlebotomy, tell them you'd like to use it. Um, and then the nurses can show you where to put it, where the best veins are. Um, and if they're not terribly busy and help you do that so that it ends up being, um, you know, they'll have two options of where they can get the blood. Thanks. And I'm going to, I feel like I'm rushing us along a little bit, but we have some great questions in just a few minutes. So okay. I'm going to go to the next, if that's okay. Yeah. That's an excellent question. How is it best to notify those who are doing the blood draw or vaccine about a needle phobia? How do you make sure the technician can be as helpful as possible? What a good question. I, excellent I mean, I question. Think, I think it's the same kind of honest communication that you're going to do to your child. You can say, just want to let you know she or he is is scared and I told them that they can do this whatever remember that whatever you're saying to the technician also saying to your child and that's how you hopefully that person says something calm and encouraging we hope so I think we have great staff at children so hopefully they would but I think I would alert them if it's your own doctor and you're going in for a pediatrician appointment I think I might tell them ahead uh let them know that that's going on uh sometimes I might ask them can we go right to a room ask you know if you can diminish the wait time because that anticipatory anxiety is uh, part of it. But I, I think, remember that what you say to that technician or that nurse or that doctor, whoever's giving you the shot is also being said to your child. And it's really good practice for self-advocacy too, which is they're kind of scared. I know they can do it. Go in there with positive statements about how you believe the child can do it as well as that they're afraid and you wonder if there are things that they know that can make it better. And they can set up a behavioral preparatory plan as well, right? For the clinic or for a proper space. Yeah, they al the you also can, you can also request the support of a child life specialist. Um, there is one that works at least part-time in phlebotomy um, and you can call ahead and find out when um, she or he will be available um, as well as in various areas of the hospital. Child life is um, in many areas of the hospital to help out. Thanks. I hope that I hope that answers your question. Um, this is: Can you speak to how helpful or not of shot blockers? Good for three to five year olds. A shot, shot blocker? blocker. A what shot, is a shot blocker? blocker. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that is either. I don't know what it is. I'm going to have to look that up. <laughs> Sorry, we can't. <laughs> Sorry, we can't answer that question right now. Um, this is, a, we have more excellent questions, but another one is when you have exhausted all the techniques, is it ever okay to go straight to holding down the child to get the shot done? Oh boy. That's a really hard one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm looking up shot blockers. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have about one, one minute left. It looks like it could be like, it looks like it might be very similar to a buzzy. Okay. Um, and I, I'm not 100% sure, but if it is, um, it, what it does is create a distraction kind of pain and gets your mind fit thinking a different way. So I'm thinking, yes, I'm feeling like um, 
and, and, and Gail, I'm curious what you would say about this. I would say it's much better to have somebody in control and able to participate in a shot as they can. Uh, on the other hand, if they're missing out, it depends on how serious it is to get them that medication and how right. serious that blood work is. And if it's a life or death issue, you're going to do whatever you can. That's going to take precedence. The medical needs are going to take precedence over mental health needs. But from a mental health perspective, it's to be avoided as much as possible holding down a child to do it. If you must, if it's like feels like absolutely critical and maybe you've tried some of these things and they're not working, I think I would really scaffold it for the child, which is, you know, we're going to hold you for a, we're going to hold you because that makes it easier for you. That makes it possible for you to get this medicine for us to get this information. But, you know, we're going to hold you and then we're going to do X and then give them some control over something. But I think it's almost I, I don't think I've had to do that with my patients in you know very very long time so hopefully not i exhaust other possibilities first and but if it's a life or death medical situation obviously that has to take priority but if i did i would scaffold it i would do it not out of anger i'd almost do a second visit and make it planful that that's what you're going to do as opposed to after a huge fight a huge begging and pleading and chasing a child around a room etc then restraining them for a shot i don't know gail what do you think yeah i i agree if it's if it's something that you can put off and, and do a better planning and preparation, I would do that. But if it's urgent and many times it is urgent, then I would, you have to do it. It's, you know, and you did the best you can to minimize that. Um, and even depending on the age of the child say, you know, if you can't cooperate, we're going to have to hold you down and I'll give you a big tight hug. So but, but you also don't, have to don't punish there. them later. Don't punish like if yeah. you have to do that, don't punish them. Remember, getting that done to them was an ordeal enough. Right. And then I, I say to them after, if you're angry, you might be angry and upset and embarrassed. If you can hold that in and say, I know that was really hard for you. That was really hard for us. Let's do something now to calm down. Let's get our coping together. Doing what you can to regroup and give them control, but also try to move beyond it. So that their pairing of the experience isn't only the shot, the being restrained, and also your anger and distress after. I think what you want to do is shift as quickly as you can to something that indicates return to normal and, and their own body control. Right. Um, and the other thing to point out to the child is that it's very important for them to be safe and for you to be safe and for the um, nurse or doctor to be safe. And yes. if they can't stay still, no one's going to be safe if they're getting a needle. Um, so that's that's when it would come down to putting a child in a situation where they where you make it so that everyone is safe. Um, I realize that it's just after one o'clock, and we have a few questions that we haven't gotten to, and um, so I'm hoping that we can get directly back to those of you um, who have asked questions, and we'll try to get back to you. Um, and I just want to say, or we want to say thank you so much for coming today. We're so glad that you did. And we're so glad that you posed excellent, um, excellent questions. I'm sure and a few of others, please let us know. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>